Um, any thoughts on leftist third party candidates? There's so many barriers put up to any third party candidates, but I feel like Jill Stein, Claudia De La Cruz, or Cornell West. Um, I like to see them do well. I don't know. Any thoughts thoughts on them? Or? Uh, well, I, I personally know Cornell West. We were at Princeton together, and uh, I like him very much. He's a great guy. He's got great instincts and good positions. Uh, he's <laughs> He's run a terrible campaign. It's kind of disappeared. I don't know what the heck is going on with that. Yeah. So I, I just think he's a non-entity in terms of his, his campaign has gone nowhere. Mm-hmm. Jill Stein has the most uh, robust campaign, and she's the most robust presence as a third-party candidate. And she has ballot access. The other left socialist candidates, like Cordy De La Cruz, I mean, these are people whose policies I support, but the they, I mean, nobody has the ballot access that the Green Party does. Uh, the problem for me is, you know, I'm not going to vote probably at all in the yeah, I'm not sure if I will. Uh, it, the problem for me is, and I've written about the electoral system for a long time, and you know, going back to 2012, the electoral system really is designed to enable fraud, and especially with the electronic voting machines, okay? And when you vote, when you vote for someone, you have no idea where that vote is going. <laughs> okay, if you're in a, if you're in a state with electronic voting machines, and all, there are other other yeah, other methods of voting have their own problems, but the proprietary software electronic voting machines can allocate those votes where they want. So if I'm voting for Jill Stein, if three five percent of the of, of of the of a state votes for Jill Stein and the Libertarian candidate. That's 5% of votes that really is a kind of electoral slush fund that the electronic voting machines can move to where they want. Uh-huh. And nobody's going to know. Jill Stein isn't going to challenge the election. She's not going to win. She can get 5% at most. Right. So she's not going to challenge the election. So she gets 3% rather than 5%. Where does that 2% go? You don't have any idea. I think it's an insult to our intelligence, an insult to, to, to us as democratic citizens to participate in this fraud, in this, you know, uh, the, pretense of a a democratic voting system. It's like, as I say, uh, sit down at this table and play poker with me. You can't see who who, who has the the dealer. You can't see the dealer. You can't see his hands. He's going to allocate the chips behind the screen and you can't see him. But it's really, really important. You'll be wasting your money if you don't sit down at this table. I say no. It's the opposite. I'm wasting my money if I sit down at that table. Yeah. I'm wasting my right to vote if I participate in a in a system that is obvious. In a fountain, let, let's not let's not forget. Already, we've known the only people you can sit down with are the high rollers. <laughs> We're going to roll you out, right? The money is already determined <laughs> who's going to win, or who, which two people are possible might possibly win. You sit down, you're going to lose, <laughs> you know. So all of these reasons, you know, the the fact that you have no People can't get on the ballot from the from the electoral college on down. You know, this is a system that is anti-democratic, and I think it's, I'm wasting my vote to participate in it. I I I would vote for Jill Stein or Claudia De La Cruz or Cornell West if I thought that vote would be registered. If I was sure that vote was going to be registered for them, because then their vote might creep up. You know, but we don't. We have no idea. We have no way of. of Determining that this is really horrible, and you need ranked choice voting, and you need a, a, a transparent electoral system where people can see that their votes haven't have been counted fairly. And I was in the elect the, the 2006 Palestinian elections, and I sat in a classroom with the teacher, and we sat with re- representatives of every party, okay. and we pulled the paper ballots out one by one and showed them to everybody in that classroom, that precinct. Everybody agreed. If there was something that they disagreed on, they all ended up agreeing either to count it this way or not to count it at all. And at the end of that, 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 that night, in that precinct, we knew who had won that election in that precinct. And he posted the results of that, pre, of, of that precinct on the door of the classroom there right then. Okay? So there was, there's no any – it's not hard. You can – I had the woman from the PFLP sitting next to me. She said, you must be really stupid doing this this way. I said, are you kidding me? This is 2006. I said, I don't know who won the last two presidential elections in the United States. I know who won this election. <laughs> I'm learning from you. Right. And, so, and so if you have an election where 
You don't count. First of all, we have the ability now with technology. Every ballot box in every county in every should be under video live stream surveillance, uh, 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 accessible to everybody in the fucking country forever. For, you know, from the from the minute they're put in a, in a room, when they come out, they go into the uh, into the precinct. There should be paper ballots. Uh, Venezuela has a system of, of backing up the 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 electronic machines with paper ballots, but you have to have paper ballots. You have to have the votes counted in the precinct. You cannot have voting, votes transmitted somewhere else, either by electronically or by the back, ballot boxes being put in a truck and taken to some central counting station. They have to be counted in the precinct, on live stream. Everybody in the country can see them counting those votes. In the room, representatives of every party, not everybody in the country can't call in and stop them, but representatives of every party, every, every precinct, in every precinct, at the end, takes, if it takes an hour, it takes 50 minutes, it takes two days, they sit in that room until they finish counting the votes in that precinct. And they then post that on the precinct and online and everybody can see it. That's the result from this precinct. And only then does that result, you know, which has been viewed by everybody and affirmed by everybody, get combined with other results. You, there's no secret to this. You can do this. You, and all of, and I'm sorry, Elect, mail-in ballots as a default are a terrible idea. And everybody said it. The Carter Baker uh, Commission on Elections back in the day said the, the absentee ballots are the most uh, amenable to, fr to fraud. And they are. You should have absentee ballots for people who cannot come to the polls. Otherwise, get people to the polls. Bring them to the polls. In-person in -person voting with paper ballots. And no, none of this ballot harvesting. That's one of the things in 2000 that happened with, with for Bush in in, in, uh, in in Florida. You can't have ballot harvesting. People going around saying, "I'll I'll take your ballot and I'll put it in. I'll put it in, I'll put the mailbox mailboxes for." I, I just this is anything that breaks the chain of custody introduces the possibility of fraud, and that's just a bad idea. Everybody has to be confident that I saw where my vote went. I saw how it was counted. I understand that the person I voted for, I got the, got, got, it was counted for them. And that's a precondition. I don't see why you'd participate in an election if you don't have those preconditions. So I, I just, this is really something, and forget the election, we go back up to the electoral college. That's another thing, but that's a constitutional issue that nobody wants to talk about. Right. It, it always blew my mind. Hillary, the, the Democrats went around after 2016 saying, oh, the country's racist and sexist because Hillary lost. What? Hillary got three, three million more votes, you said. If the Electoral College weren't there, right. you wouldn't be going around saying the country is racist and sexist. You'd be going around saying how fast the country is because they were elected Hillary Clinton. It wasn't, right. it wasn't. It was the Electoral College that defeated Hillary. It wasn't Putin. I mean... But nobody wants to talk about that. Between the, you have to solve the electoral system between the elections, and neither party does it. They complain, and they want to have this system where they complain after the election because they have reasons to complain. They always have good reasons. They do. And then you have a fight about that, and that's the fight they want you to have. They don't want to solve the problem. They want to keep you fighting about that and, and never solve it because they're not really – they don't really care that much who's elected. They care that the system continues to be the way it is. When well, you're fighting about bullshit that they, they can solve very easily, but they're not going to because they want you fighting about bullshit. And uh, the electoral system is, is, is the first place for that. So what I'm saying is if I were inventing a third party, I, I, I called in 2000, 2012, from, since 2012. I think the best thing that a, a, a left we got a political party. I think there should be a one-issue movement led by the left to boycott presidential elections until the electoral system is fixed. Wow. You would have everybody from all the way right to all the way left on your side on that. You want, but you have to be honest about this. You have to be upfront about this. You know, mail-in ballots, default mail-in ballots are a bad idea. You have to have a chain of custody, you know. Find absentee ballots for sure for people who cannot get to the to, to the ballot box. They're away. They're out of the country. Uh -huh. Whatever. But not everybody just mails it. I, that's a terrible idea. Anything that breaks the chain of custody, anything that makes it opaque. How exactly did that vote get there? You know, that's a bad idea. But so what I'm saying is, I think the, the, the precondition for elect progressive electoral politics is change the electoral system.
Mm. That's a precondition. I don't know why anybody would, would and again, it's like sitting down at a poker table where it's all fixed and you know it. You just don't know how, how it's fixed, but and then never, you're never going to be able to find out. So like, why would I do that? that you, 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 this is silly. And this is, a, this is a danger for the country. And it does lead, it's going to lead to civil war conditions because everybody is convinced they're being cheated and they're probably right. Right. Interesting what you were saying. The U.S. is now challenging the elections in Venezuela of yeah. all places. We have no election integrity ourselves. <laughs> We're challenging in Venezuela, <laughs> which is insane. Another <laughs> coup attempt. The second coup attempt. There's one Guaido and now... Now another coup attempt. But I was going to ask you, um, what are the, uh, you, you talked about the uh, chances of a regional war in, in the Middle East or in, uh, with Iran. It looks like it's building up to it. Um, Iran was boxed into a situation where they will have to react. It's bigger than it was in April. Um, Revolutionary Guard leaders were, of course, assassinated in Damascus back in April, and Iran retaliated. But Israel is still showing they can assassinate leaders with total impunity. The U.S. is not reining them in. Could have done something to rein them in. Iran will now doesn't doesn't want a regional war, and I don't think the U.S. wants to read the Biden people really want a regional war either. Although some elements probably do, but it looks like it may be heading towards that. Do you think we there will be it'll it'll most likely be catastrophic if there is? Yes. Uh- uh, unfortunately, yes. Look, I, I don't see how a, a, a conflict like that can be avoided, especially with what's going on in, in, in Gaza. But the, yeah. it, this is this is Zionism. This is what the question that's being called is the future of the Zionist project. And the Israelis are very, very clear about what they're doing. This is 1948 on steroids. They are saying, Okay, we pretended for 50 years of, with, that we were going along with this two-state solution stuff. We let you think that we were doing that. You know, we, never, we were never doing that. We were never going along with any of that. Uh, our project is Jewish supremacist colonialism, okay? We, if we could get the millions of Palestinians that are under our rule in the Gaza and the West Bank to accept that via negotiations, fine, but they're not going to accept it. <laughs> that, that's October 7th, put the nail, we're not going to sit around waiting for them to accept it because they're going to keep revolting against it as any colonized people will. So our project now is to finish 48. It's to expel and exterminate the 80% of the remaining Palestinians the way we did in exterminate and expel 80% of the Palestinians in, in uh, 48. In 48. And that's what we're going to do. And watch us, we're doing it. We're killing all the children. We want to kill the children. They're the future of Palestine. That's that, that not a mistake. Everybody they're, knows they're, it, too. Everybody knows it. I, they, and they don't, you know, you can read them saying it. They say it to themselves, but, but publicly. You know, we're, we're killing everybody. They're all snakes. They're all Amalek. They're all, they're, they're saying it. And it's only self-deceived American and Western liberals who say, well, we're going to have liberal Zionism and we're going to get them back to the negotiation. We're going to have a two-state solution. They're going to they not interested in a second and two-state solution. They're not interested in getting the hostages back. They're interested in getting the Palestinians out. And they are succeeding in that. Nobody is stopping it. Mm-hmm. And uh, Iran has to be, and, and Hezbollah, this is a calling the question on Zionism, of Zionism. Mm-hmm. And uh, Iraq, Israel, as I've said, a couple of, you know, shown, that demonstrated that evidence that the United States, Israel has been planning with the United States for an attack on Israel, on, on Iran. Mm-hmm. The U.S. doesn't really want to get into it, but they will if the Israel pushes them in and is forcing them into it. Israel is forcing Iran to react. Mm-hmm. And the, the Israel cannot defeat Iran and Hezbollah without American assistance. And the Americans will assist. They will do everything they can. They will use every weapon tell you what they're going to say. The, Israel, the Americans will say to the Israelis, oh, please, you know, we, we'll go in, we'll help you attack Iran, but just don't use nuclear weapons. Okay, Israel will say, we won't use nuclear weapons. The attack will start, the war will begin, Israel will use nuclear weapons. Because Israel knows Iran and the axis of resistance are getting stronger every year. They want to put an end to that before it's too late. Mm-hmm. And but Iran is a powerful country, and his Hezbollah is powerful. The only weapons that will stop Iran for put them out of the game for 10 years at least, or they, Israel thinks will do that, and the only weapons that anybody could think might do that would be use of nuclear weapons. Israel doesn't have nuclear weapons to sit on. They have nuclear weapons to use, and not against hot Gaza, not against the West Bank, against the stronger country like Iran. And they want to 
They want to do that, and they will do that. But the question is how much Iran will do. What kind of attack Iran will make? Is Iran saying to itself, okay, we have to go into this battle now, and, and, and there has to be a defeat of Israel in some way. Who's going to control Gaza in six months? I said that eight months ago. Who's going to control Gaza in six months? Israel. Who's going to control Gaza in six months? Israel. What's that going to mean to the Palestinians? Who's going to control Gaza a year from now? Israel. Unless Israel is defeated, mm-hmm. defeated, suffers a real hurt, it's going to continue slaughtering Palestinians and going to continue assassinating every axis of resistance leader that it wants. What is it going to take to stop Israel from doing that. Is Iran entering the war? Is Iran going to enter this saying, we are entering this with the purpose of stopping Israel from doing that, or we're entering it from the purpose of making a, making a statement that we won't be, you know, we're not afraid and we'll get you back. That's a, that's a big decision Iran has to make. But if they, do not, if they do not fight to a conclusion that stops Israel from doing it, then Iran is lost. I mean, then Israel has won. It's gone another step, and it's it's going to continue ratcheting up with Iran until it gets to war, probably, unless it sees that Iran is just backing off completely and giving up, and it's going to let them continue slaughter, uh, assassinating leaders and slaughtering Palestinians, and they're not going to do anything about it. And it's just a real problem, but that's what we're facing here. I, I, I want to see, and I know everybody, all the pro-Palestinian people, they're absolutely right. Hezbollah has hundreds of thousands of missiles. Iran can't be defeated. All true. Who's going to be running Gaza in six months from now, a year from now? I'm bitten and Benjamin not you. I say, I know, I will, because I have the... I was going to ask you, um, many people, I know people on the Trotskyist left who feel that the, uh, who still support a two-state solution and think that the Israeli working class would join with the Palestinian struggle. I don't see that as very likely at all. I think that's utopian, and I think it's one-dimensional Marxism, frankly. I was wondering what your, your thoughts would be on that. Yeah, I think, uh, it, you know, look, this is like, this is like South Africa. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, my Marxism... Uh, there are uh, relatively autonomous uh, things going on at the same time. Okay, you know, you got to think about South Africa. What was the, what was the the ultimate contradiction for us Marxists is always the working class and socialism. And, but there can be a principal a principal enemy and a principal contradiction at the time, which in South Africa was apartheid. Okay, mm-hmm. and you know you can't you can't collapse one into the other. These things are relatively autonomous, and you have to fight for them uh, according to the specific terms of the situation you're in. And in Black South, in South Africa, pre you know pre Mandela South Africa, the principal contradiction for the black people of South Africa, the majority of people of South Africa, was ending apartheid. Okay, similarly here. The, the, this is a this is colonialism, you know, and you can't say well the colonial struggle has to be part of the uh, international working class struggle. Well, really, the international working class struggle has to recognize in this specific situation that for the for the majority of these people, for the for the colonized people, their primary enemy at the moment, and it's real, and you can't just tell them don't think about that, think about this is the Jewish supremacist colonialism, okay, which is killing them, literally killing them and starving them and doing nothing but trying to kill them and expel them. And that has to be dealt with whether, and, 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 and the fact is that the, the, there's a, 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 the working class is not going to go along with you on that. And you can't wait for that to happen, okay? That, that's just not ethically responsible and you know uh and it's it's not you know uh, marx was clearly on the side of the irish and clearly on the side of the of, of the indians you know what i mean this is not there's a principal contradiction here which is the colonialist enterprise that the palestinian arabs are being crushed by that you know is going and the, the, the many of the early zionists were socialists they thought there could be something as like you know socialist in Zionism. And that's just a lot of baloney. At the end of the day, you can, I mean, 
maybe in some theoretical sense, you could have socialism, which uh, has an underclass or has a, has a group based on some kind of ethnic supremacy or has that implicit in it. But that's not a socialism that's going to conquer the world because the world is going to be against you on that. So, mm-hmm. you, you know, this is, again, this is like, you know, yes, uh, uh, it, it's not Marxism, it's not socialism to fight against colonialism. It's necessary precondition for any kind of socialist, uh, any kind of socialist movement, any kind of world socialist movement, certainly, to okay. fight against the remnants of colonialism. And this is one of the worst remnants of colonialism that there is. It's, it's blatant colonialism that justifies itself through all kinds of baloney, and you have to cut through it and be against it. Right, interesting. Yeah, uh, John Elmer of Electronic Intifada is a mili- Canadian military expert. Uh, he, he mentioned that when Hamas formed their militia back in 2007, a lot of leftists joined them, a lot of Marxists joined, joined them. I think it's good to think more in terms of the Palestinian resistance rather than the separate organizations. Hamas, they're Islamists. They don't have good politics. They're <laughs> somewhat corrupt. Their popularity has declined. But they're part of the military. The Al-Qasim brigades are the Palestinian resistance. I think it's more important to think in terms of this. Yes. Um, another question I have, why well, is uh, it- to, to make that point, I mean, it wasn't just Hamas who were participating in October 7th. There was the PIJ and it was the PFLP. Okay. PF, PIJ, PFLP, and Hamas are all parts of the Palestinian resistance in Gaza right now. And okay. Israel wants to make it Hamas, Hamas, Hamas. But it is, as you say, we should think of it as the Palestinian resistance. Right. Um, 